Welcome to Translating Islands, a reading and conversation on translation with Raquel Salas Rivera, Nicole Delgado, and Karina Del Valle Shorsky. Um, I, my name is Erin Grafziven, and I'm chair of the Department of Comparative Literature, which houses a brand new, almost brand new, graduate certificate in translation studies. This is our second major event as it's our second year in existence. Um, so I would like to welcome you on behalf of the graduate certificate in translation studies. If you're a PhD student here at USC and think you might want to learn more about the certificate, at the end of the event, when you're perusing the beautiful publications of today's speakers, you will also see some material about the graduate certificate. Uh, feel free also to reach out to me if you have any questions. So um, I wanted to, unfortunately I'm not presenting our wonderful speakers uh, today, but I will introduce uh, my colleague Ronald Mendoza de Jesus, assistant professor of what is your official title, Latin American? Spanish. Uh, assistant professor of Spanish, who has organized this wonderful event. Um, and Ronald will introduce um, our guests today. So thank you and welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Erin, for all your help. Also, thank you all of all for, to Catherine and to Bertha who make everything possible in, in, our, in our department. And thank you to all of the sponsoring units. You, you didn't mention them, right? So I should go through them. So thank you to the uh, Humanities Institute, uh, the Levan Humanities Institute at USC. Thank you to the Department of Gender Studies, the English Department, the Department of American Studies and Ethnicity, uh, Comparative Literature, and above all to the uh, Department of Latin American and Iberian Cultures. And Roberto is here, he's his chair, which uh, contributed enormously to the possibility of this event. So uh, I wanted, I mean, I will not speak much because I'm, too, I'm a little bit ill, but I did wanted to say a couple of things about the reason why I thought about putting together this event. So I first saw on Facebook that uh, Raquel and Karina were gonna be uh, together in an event in the Bay Area, and I immediately sort of like intercepted the, the you know, obviously Facebook allows that kind of thing. I saw Nicole posting, oh, I, it would be awesome if the three of us were together. I was like, well, let's make it happen, and let's just make it happen here. And the reason why I thought it would make a lot of sense for this to be an event in translation, as opposed to, for example, something just on, on Puerto Rico or Puerto Rican literature or uh, any other ways in which you could make sense together, uh, has to do with the ways in which I think your work has helped me to rethink what translation means, both theoretically but also practically. And that's hence the title, Translating Islands. Uh, so I, 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 when I think about islands, I think about this phrase from Derrida that Mara Negron loved, uh, there's no world, there's only islands. And in that, that passage, which appears uh, towards the beginning of the last seminar that Derrida gives before he dies, uh, and I say this also to mark uh, the, the presence of, of, of deconstruction and of Derrida's thinking and of Peggy's leadership in the formation of this program, uh, uh, at that moment, there is thinking about translation and about insularity as an interruption of the world. That there's, there's no world, there's only islands. Hence, translation is the desire for the islands to constitute a world that doesn't yet come together, that doesn't yet finally cohere. And one way of reading that is to say that, oh, there is is insisting translation is impossible, as he famously says, right? But then he also, also famously insists translation is always possible. You just need enough time, you need the means to translate, but translation is intrinsically possible. And I do think that that second way of reading that translation, uh, that possibility of translation or the possibility of creating a precarious world through translation is what I see in the world that you three have created and is what I see in, the, in your work also individually as islands. And it is work that always makes me want to go back to that island called Puerto Rico. So that's, without further ado, I'm going to present uh, our, our speakers. So 
Uh, we begin with Raquel Salas Rivera, who's a Puerto Rican poet, translator, and literary critic. In 2010, they won first and second place for poetry in the Polytechnic University of Puerto Rico's literary contest. I think this is really a sign of an imprimatur of like a destiny that Raquel just like takes all the awards, just first, second, and third, all for her, all for them. And then, as well as the first place in the University of Puerto Rico's queer literature contest. In 2018, they were named the 2018-19 poet Lord of Philadelphia. They are the inaugural recipient of the Ambrogio Prize and the Laurel Fellowship, both from the Academy of American Poets. They have also received fellowships and residences from the Sundance Institute, the Kimmel Center for Performing Arts, the Arizona Poetry Center, and Canto Mundo. And from 2016 to 18, they co-edited the literary journal, The Wanderer. In 2017, they co-edited a series of bilingual broadsides of contemporary Puerto Rican poets, which were later collected in the Puerto Rico and Mi Corazón anthology, which was co-edited also with Karina, and is an absolute piece of, of love and, and of pain. Uh, and the introduction is about translation. I would love to hear more about that introduction, the split tongue of, of Puerto Ricans. They are also the author of seven chapbooks and four full-length poetry volumes. The first two books, Caneca de los Turbios and Tierra Interminente, were published in Puerto Rico. Their third book, Lo Terciario, the Tertiary, was on the 2018 National Book Award long list and won the 2018 Lambda Literary Award for, for Transgender Poetry. Their fourth book, While They Sleep, under the Bed is Another Country, was published by Birds in 2019. They received their PhD in comparative literature and literary theory from UPenn. And Raquel lives and works in Philadelphia, but soon they will be in Puerto Rico. Uh, so we will also have here with us Nicole Cecilia Delgado, who's a poet, translator, and publisher. Nicole studied comparative literature at the University of Puerto Rico and received an MA in Latin American and Caribbean Studies from SUNY Albany. She was part of the poetry collective The Megaphone Poets in Mexico City between 2008 and 2009. Uh, in 2009, Nicole and Xavier Balcácer created Atarraya Cartonera, Puerto Rico's first cartonera press, which published more than 40 volumes that showcase many leading and emergent poets from the Americas. Since 2012, she organizes the Feria de Libros Independientes y Alternativos in Puerto Rico, and she currently direct, directs La Impresora, a workspace for graphic and editorial experimentation that also specializes on the production and reproduction of books in risograph printing. Nicole has published almost 20 books of poetry and has been a guest poet at the Feria Internacional del Libro de La Habana, the Feria Internacional del Libro de Guayaquil, and the Festival de la Palabra in Puerto Rico, the Latinale in Berlin, and Under the Volcano in Tepotzlan. And this is also missing the uh, Feria Libro del Zócalo from last year, but I'm, I'm sure it's missing so much. But she has also participated in poetry fairs, artistic residencies and exhibits in Puerto Rico, New York, California, Mexico, Guatemala, Panama, and El Salvador. Her work has been published broadly and has been translated to English, Catalan, Galician, Polish, German, and Portuguese. More recently, she published the anthology Apenas un Cantaro, which brings together some of her poems between 2007 and 2017, and Periodo Especial, which provides a powerful meditation of her own process of returning to a Puerto Rico in economic and environmental crises. And finally, we'll have Karina del Valle Shorke, who's a Puerto Rican poet, translator, and essayist with roots in the Bay Area. She's currently a PhD candidate at Columbia's Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, where she's writing a dissertation that focuses on women's performance and multimedia practice in the Americas, from Sora Neil Hurston through Ana Mendieta. She's also interested in the history of psychoanalysis and other forms of psycho psychic inquiry and self-care among communities of color. Karina was awarded the 2016 Gulf, Prize, Gulf Coast Prize in translation for her renditions of Marigloria Palma's poetry into English. Her critical essays have been featured in LARB, so the LARB, New York Times Magazine, Boston Review, Lit Hub, uh, Small Axe Salon, The New Yorker Online, and Long Reads, among other publications. And she's currently working on a book manuscript, The Other Island, notes, uh, well, this, what, what's the subtitle? The Other Island, forthcoming from Riverhead, which provides a, what will be a beautiful physiognomy of Puerto Rican culture across the Atlantic. So without further ado, I'm just going to let uh, Raquel begin. We're going to have, the, they will have time. 
uh, about 20 minutes, and then we'll have a conversation about translation and whatnot. But if you, the, if the three of you want to sit there, or if you want to stay here, whatever you, how are you going to do it? Okay. No tenemos un cosito de esto para aguantarlo. No, yo lo aguanto. Okay, perfect. Hola. Hey. Verdad, nadie dice hola aquí. Estamos en California. Por lo menos saben lo que es hola, ¿no? Um, hi, how are we? Cool. Voy a leer un texto sobre la autotraducción. I'm going to read a text um, on self-translation. I was told by other translators that one is not supposed to self-translate. It is an inviolable rule like using non-binary pronouns with my grandmother, being queer, standing naked in front of the church, or letting my enemies see me cry. If you self-translate, you end up changing too much or misunderstanding your words. Being too close to yourself is constitutive of identification. We can never know who we are as other. We must always mediate our entry into the workforce of language by asking permission. Are my words worthy of being broken and reborn? Has God chosen this passage? Self-translation is indulgence gone awry. It is the act of one who is closed off in perpetuity to transfusions. The opposite of donating blood, it is to be deficient. I went to school, to more school and then to the final school of all schools. There I learned I was wrong to believe that the word of an illiterate person was as powerful and determinate as that of a professor, wrong to speak without quoting, believe without an institution, and pray without a god. Violence was normalized. I shouldn't be shocked that a person who directly oppressed my people won teaching awards. One must learn to unlearn oneself. The widest cynicism crept into my work. I learned to laugh at others, but with detail. I learned to be cruel. Wherever I read, I was gathering only crucial information. A slow read was called parsing. We were surgeons performing exploratory surgeries. We didn't have time to experience our own embodiment. My body has become, had become labor. I stopped writing poetry. When my mother and I spoke, she expressed she was worried. Todo está bien, mami. Estoy un poco cansada, pero estoy bien. And then I broke free. Like most freedoms, it began with anger. All the betrayals I had allowed suddenly shook in the body I had set aside, my body. There are no objective stances. There are no intimacies that don't have their own anti-epistemologies, no proximities and enmeshments that don't produce translations. To be free, I had to accept that my translations would always be fetishes, not commandments. So in lieu of commandments, I offer a list of fetishes for the self-translator. One, the poem is only a body because someone wrote it. If you cannot touch a part of yourself and feel the poem, it has not been written and cannot be rewritten. Throughout your life, you will be told you are insufficient. Do not believe them. Even if you change, it is not because you were flawed before, it is because you are mid-translation. There are three, there are terrible translators. They enter poems without consent, not even when they have a legal agreement. They insist there is a method to love and will tell you it has been written and researched. They, are cor they correct you in your language, but when asked about theirs, feign neutrality. They are the bookkeepers. Do not ask for their help. Steal the books. For when your word is the same in both languages, let no one convince you that it must be understood. Five, for everything that is withheld by the new language, make sure you are withholding something in return. For everything that is given, give in return. Six, prepare the area for translation. Create an altar of inalterable objects. Make sure it has shells from wherever you were born, an image or an iconoclastic portal. Eat the translation. Dance with it until you are so tired you feel sore and blissed out. Seven, care about the words and the people who wrote them. Have opinions that cut through as feelings, vibes, insistences. Eight, be rude. In fact, be so rude someone corrects you. Then listen, come back to your rudeness, sure of where you were and where you are. Nine, do not believe in transcendence, do not believe in perfection, do not believe in universality. There was no Babel, nor ruins. There is no puzzle, nor are we whole in sameness. 
pretend this is neither art nor profession. You are not, as Ezra Pound suggested, a mechanic, nor is a mechanic, as Ezra Pound suggested, mechanical. This is the part of the poem that survives capitalism, the part that couldn't be beaten down by fear. You are honoring that part in yourself as you honor the poem through translation. May these guide you through yourself with the knowledge you already hold, and may the new words be an unraveling. So, as you may have guessed, I'm a self-translator. Uh, this is from Lo Terciario, The Tertiary. It is a book um, based on a translation of Marx's Capital by Pedro Scarón, which was very popular in the 70s and 80s and very important for political formation programs all over Latin America, and was how my parents met and made out and got married and had me. Quedará siempre un sustrato material. Escenario 4. Senex descubre que existen múltiples nadas, como existen múltiples infinitos. No, no son dobles noes, sino nadas cada una excluyendo la otra completamente. La nada de números imposibles, la nada de fracciones inconmensurables, la nada de hormigueros de miel, cuarzos de nieve y pis, la nada de plátanos rosita, la nada del regreso, la nada de mis manos congeladas que cortaron y llevo de pie de conejo. Senex descubre que existen peores, peores. Uh, esto está como... Está intenso. A material substratum will always remain. Scene four. Senex discovers there are multiple nothings like multiple infinities. No, they aren't double no's. More like nothings, each one excluding the other completely. The nothing of impossible numbers, the nothing of incommensurable fractions, the nothing of honey ant hills, quarts of snow and piss, the nothing of pink plantains, the nothing of return, the nothing of my frozen hands they've cut and I carry like a rabbit's foot. Senex discovers there are worse, worse, Escenario 7. Odette plancha el flamboyán pétalo a pétalo. En el relicario mezcla jazmín y Elizabeth Arden, su última descendiente pata, se casa lejanamente con el cuerpo lagarto del sauce. Algún huevo en algún hervor, alguna casa vendida, las paredes avestadas, el canal católico puesto a todo volumen, la cantidad de dolor en la piel incremental. Se acumula porque el Papa ha dicho que este cuerpo es carnal. La deuda carnal, la mano del papa sagrada, el perreo carnal, el vecino bolitero carnal, el monte donde yace el tanque de agua carnal, su nombre carnal, la estatua de la Virgen sagrada. Scene 7. Petal by petal, Odette irons the flamboyant in the reliquary, a mix of Jasmine and Elizabeth Arden. Her last dyke descendant gets married far away with the lizard body of the willow, some egg in some boiling, some house sold, the walls is best sewed, the Catholic channel at full volume, the amount of pain in the skin incremental. It accumulates because the Pope has said this body is carnal, the debt carnal. The hand of the Pope sacred, perreo carnal, the bolitero neighbor carnal, the hill where the water tank sits carnal, the statue of the Virgin sacred. Escenario 8. Senex se inyecta y visco. Quiere solamente mezclar ron y leche, inyectarse de cuanto florecer aparezca entre risco y florero, vender frutas en el puesto, cerrar el puesto por la ley de fruta podrida, inyectarse con metal y carpa, helar el agua, ser hielero, venderle bolas de cemento al gobierno, vender pinchos, horchata, mabí, vender recuerdos de Puerto Rico, viles, tendencias a correr por parte del pueblo. Socarrar gomas, vender colección de gomitas, lotería de 5 pesos por 15 millones, limón por 50, y que te paguen con TDT. Trucar TDT por TDT por TDT, vender servicios de limpiar patios de TDT. Subcontratarse a limpiar las calles de vendedores sin licencias de vendidos. Subgar desde el arrebato porque no hay armonía, porque quedamos vivos y el hibisco manso dura más allá del próximo pago. Scene 8. 
So next, inject themselves with hibiscus. They only want to mix rum and milk, inject themselves with as much flowering as they can find in between crag and flower pot, sell fruit at the stand, close the stand due to the rotten fruit law, inject themselves with metal and tent, freeze the water, be an ice seller, sell cement balls to the government, sell pinchos, or chata mavi, sell souvenirs of Puerto Rico. Bills, tendencies to run on behalf of the people, char tires, sell collections of rubber bands, lottery of five bucks for 15 million, lemon for 50, and they pay you with IOU, trade IOU for IOU for IOU, sell services for cleaning yards of IOU, subcontracting oneself to clean the streets of sellers without sellout licenses, judging while high because there is no harmony, because we're still alive and the tame hibiscus lasts beyond the next payment. Escenario 11. Senex interrumpe la misa. Atracón de hostias. Envenenamiento de sangre de Dios. Senex interrumpe su ascensión para preconcibir un mundo sin deuda. Le cortan los sistemas reproductivos como tantos vagones en desuso. Diciendo, no cualificas como mujer hasta que pases las tres pruebas del Conservatorio Nacional. Prefiere succionar todo diálogo de sus entrañas, cortarse los eufemismos como órganos adicionales, mosaiquear la cara de Dios con pinceles baratos, erosionar, 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 interrumpir la misa con desglose etimológico, leer los nombres de las hermanas asesinadas, pontificar sobre la industria pecuaria, defenderse del tedio punzante de la colonización. Sin 11. Senex interrupts mass, binges on wafers, is poisoned by the blood of God. Senex interrupts their ascension to preconceive a world without debt. They cut their reproductive organs like so many unused railroad cars, saying, you don't qualify as a woman until you've passed the three tests of the National Conservatory. They prefer to suction all dialogue from their bowels, cut off the euphemisms like additional organs, mosaic the face of God with cheap paint brushes, erode, 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 interrupt mass with an etymological breakdown, read the names of the murdered sisters, pontificate about the meat industry, defend themselves against the piercing tedium of colonization. Escenario 12. Puerto Rico prende sus luciérnagas para aparecer luz ansiosa en el mapa mundi. Scene 12, Puerto Rico turns on its fireflies in order to appear, an anxious light on the world map. Escenario 13, Cenex verifica que has muerto. Tu jugo de arándano en saguanes inunda linduras, recolector de colibríes, harás alfombras boleales de plumillas, pilas de periódicos en tu apartamento 3A. Si cortas la grama, saldrán hormigas de la fisura. Si abres las cortinas, habrán expertos disecando cual demosticadores del caos. Mándalos para el carajo y date un trago conmigo. Yo invito. Scene 13. Senex verifies that y'all have died. Your blueberry juice in the hallways that drown pretties gather of dead hummingbirds. You'll make blanket borealis of nibs, piles of newspapers in your apartment 3A. If you cut the grass, the ants will come out of the fissure. If you open the curtains, there will be experts dissecting like domesticators of chaos. Tell them to fuck off and let's get a drink. It's on me. Escenario 14. Senex procrea con su fantasma, quien le dice. Puedes llorar. Aquí todos lloramos. Nadie te juzga. Si sientes que pierdes tu isla, si te vas y te quedas, puedes llorar. Tienes derecho a odiar tus opresores. Derecho a quitarte las medias sin quitarte la correa. A colapsar como un edificio de contrato en una ruta corta. A disolver las palabras. Scene 14, Senex procreates with their ghost who says, you can cry, here we all cry. No one will judge you. If you feel you're losing your island, if you leave, if you stay, you can cry. You have a right to hate your oppressors, a right to take off your socks, but not your belt, to collapse like an edifice of contract on the short route, to dissolve words. Escenario final. 
Mi madre dice que está muy desmoralizada para escribir poemas sobre la deuda. Su mano aprieta mi corazón dislocado. Me pregunta si leí los poemas que me envió, si me gustaron. Son cortos. Me gustan, le digo. Sus poemas sobre la deuda son largos como los míos. Igualitos, me dice, y nos lloramos por no matarnos. Igualitos. Mi madre nunca dice esto. Aunque sí me dice que no puede escribir poemas sobre la deuda, pero no explica. Aunque sí llora y me aprieta el corazón. Aunque sí escribe poemas que son como los míos sobre la deuda. Aunque no lo dicen los poemas. De la deuda se tratan todos. Aunque no se lo diga nunca. Final scene. My mother says she's too demoralized to write poems about the debt. Her hand squeezes my dislocated heart. She asked me if I've read the poems she sent me, if I liked them. They're short. I like them, I say. Her poems about the debt are long, like mine. They're the same, she says, and we cry so as not to kill each other. Exactly the same. My mother never says this. Even when, yes, she says she can't write poems about the debt but doesn't explain. Even when, yes, she cries and squeezes my heart. Even when, yes, she writes poems that are like mine about the debt. Even though she doesn't say it in the poems, they're all about the debt. Even if I never, ever say these words out loud, even then. Gracias. Thank you. Okay, come here and go. And Thank you for being here. <laughs> um, before I start reading my poetry, I wanted to tell you that I work outside academia and that I'm an activist for poetry and that translation is one of the ways in which I sustain my life. So I have a slightly different approach to, to translation because it is my job. And also, I wanted to tell you that as a, as a poet who works outside from academia, a, one of the things that sustains my life also is friendship and relationships with writers and colleagues. And, and that translation is one of the ways in which these relationships exist in, so, With that said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read some of my work. I wanna start with a poem called Sin Miedo because today is the International Day for Awareness about gender violence. And it's a poem about gender violence. Sin Miedo. Recuerdo que antes fui una mujer sin miedo una mujer joven viajando sola por México y Centroamérica. No era posible pensar en morir camino a la tortillería, una mañana en un pueblo desconocido de Chiapas o Tamaulipas, ni traduciendo poemas en un internet café, ni siquiera en un hotel desvencijado en Amecameca, después de consumir grandes cantidades de éxtasis con mis amigas. Tampoco sentí miedo en aquel autobús dañado a mitad de la autopista México-Veracruz, donde hace unas semanas secuestraron un camión lleno de niños y mujeres migrantes. Ni en los arrecifes llenos de tiburones de Belice, ni derretida en el paisaje demasiado húmedo de Livingston, 
ni contaminada de cándida en Isla de Flores, en medio del lago del Petén, ni perdida en Michoacán después de tantos días acampando en la playa. Una siempre piensa que la historia solo se mueve hacia el futuro, que no hay otra dirección posible, pero llegan noticias escalofriantes. Hace poco supe de una mujer molida en las máquinas de una carnicería en el Estado de México y de la amiga de un amigo asesinada cerca del paraíso en Costa Rica, su cadáver besado por el mar. Reconozco que ahora a veces siento miedo. No tan lejos de mi casa siento miedo cuando las ametralladoras parten la noche de Santurce en pedacitos o si diariamente hay hombres que matan a sus novias por amor. Ya no se siente seguro siquiera sacar a pasear a los perros o llegar tarde a casa cualquier noche después de tomar unas cervezas. He visto la amenaza acercar nuestras vidas y cada vez hay menos espacios seguros. Yo no sé si antes me salvó la ingenuidad o un hada madrina sobre mi hombro izquierdo. Tuve la fortuna de ser una mujer libre, viajando sola, sin temer la muerte. Qué horror sentir que la excepción fui yo. Bueno, now I'm going to read a poem that's called Traducción, and it's a, a bad or loose translation of Allen Ginsberg's America. Uh, a couple of years ago, I worked on a project which was an anthology of 30 different translations, loose translations of the same poem by 30 different Latin American poets and each one of them rewrote the poem from their own America. And I'm gonna read my version. América, me lo gasté todo y, y no soy nadie. América, 2015, 2 de enero, 0 dólares más IU. Me duele la cabeza. ¿Cuándo pasan la nueva de Star Wars? Jódete tú con la semilla transgénica. No escribiré este poema hasta que no me sienta bien. América, ¿cuándo serás esdrújula? ¿Qué esperas para desnudarte? ¿Cuándo vas a mirarte a través de las vitrinas? ¿Cuándo harás caso a nuestro millón de inconformes? América, ¿por qué tus bibliotecas tienen goteras? América, ¿por qué no envías tus obras completas a Haití? Me da asco tu loca pretensión. ¿Cuándo podré robar vino del supermercado sin que suene la alarma? No hay que irse lejos. Tu economía es mucho para mí. Me hiciste querer ser una Barbie. No nos tenemos que poner de acuerdo. América, después de todo, somos igual de perfectas. Quienes valían la pena se fueron a New York. No van a volver. Eso lo sabemos todos. ¿Lo haces por maldad o es una broma pesada? Lo que quiero es llegar al meollo del asunto. No voy a abandonar el juego. América, no jodas. Yo sé lo que hago. América, los cítricos tienen hongo. No he leído los periódicos en meses. Todos los días un hombre mata a una mujer. América, me dan sentimiento los conserjes. América, desde niña fui comunista y no me había dado cuenta. Fumo hachís cada vez que puedo. Me da con quedarme en casa y limpiar obsesivamente. Me emborracho en Santurce y ya no me voy con mi ex. Ya me decidí. Esto no va a ser fácil. Debiste haber leído teoría feminista. La señora de la botánica dice que estoy súper bien. Hace rato me cansé de rezar Padre Nuestros. Ahora abrazo árboles, prendo velas, 
voy a ceremonias de peyote. América, no te he dicho lo que le hiciste a papi cuando empezó con el crack. Óyeme que te estoy hablando. ¿Cómo vamos a dejar que Facebook controle nuestros sentimientos? Estamos obsesionados con Facebook. Todo el tiempo lo estoy chequeando. Facebook nos persigue desde todas las ventanas, todos los gadgets, todas las cámaras de seguridad. Lo miro en el trabajo y también en los aeropuertos. Hasta mi mamá tiene Facebook. Facebook me recuerda que Big Brother is watching. Por eso debo ser más responsable. Mis amigas de la infancia, todos son mamás y papás, o doctores, o ingenieros, o abogados, o cineastas, todos más serios que yo. Mi segundo nombre pudo haber sido América, Nicola América. Estoy fumando sola otra vez. Asia me resulta tan desconocida, pero no tengo los medios. Mejor me quedo aquí descubriendo mis recursos nacionales. Mis recursos nacionales son un pasaporte gringo, un huevo hidropónico, miles de fotos digitales, 300 millas de playas bioluminiscentes y el peso del colonialismo. No diré nada de los presos políticos ni del montón de mantenidos que vivimos del gobierno federal. Abolimos los puteros de Cuba. Ahora vámonos a República Dominicana. Quiero ser presidente a pesar de que soy puertorriqueña. América, ¿cómo se escriben haikus con tu mala leche? América, te vendo poemas en el dollar store. Te doy descuento a cambio de tus poemas inéditos. América libera a Nina Dross. América revive a los macheteros. América que no mueran María Gloria ni Ángela María. América violencia doméstica y abuso sexual. América mi mamá nunca me llevó al grito de Lares. En 1998 fui sola por primera vez. Vendían helados de aguacate y de arroz con habichuelas. En 2001 la desobediencia. Después de Vieques, todos se apagaron un poco. Cuando el FBI asesinó a Filiberto, yo ya estaba viviendo en New York. En la isla siempre hubo demasiado chotas. América, ¿en serio necesitamos la guerra? América, ¿estamos seguros de que los malos son los árabes? América, eres tu peor enemiga. Los extraterrestres ya nos comieron vivos. El descontrol del poder y el hambre de petróleo. Los carros se van a oxidar en el garaje. Las farmacéuticas se van a mudar de isla. Ángel de la especulación. Ruina de las gasolineras. Y no será bueno. Vamos a tener que trabajar la tierra y escribir a mano. Qué terrible. Quizá hasta te hagan falta esclavos. Veremos entonces si al que madruga Dios lo ayuda y si la necesidad es la madre de la invención. Auxilio. América, esto no es chiste. América, no tengo tele, pero siempre me entero. América, vas a estar bien. Mejor no me meto en lo que no me importa. No cuentes conmigo. No voy a trabajar en un fast food ni a meterme al U.S. Army. Anyway, soy vegetariana y miope. América, le ofrezco a tu historia mi culo grande. Entonces, I was telling you earlier that translation is one of the ways in which friendship between poets happen. <laughs> and I'm gonna read a couple of poems of my book, Periodo Especial, that were translated by another colleague of us, Ura Joan Noel, which is an amazing Puerto Rican poet based in New York, who also does self-translation and has translated many great poets and has even translated concrete poetry, which is really difficult. <laughs> 
and he's one of my heroes. I'm, I'm a big fan. <laughs> and while I, I read, you can follow his translations on the screen. Solsticio de verano, noche de San Juan. Se nos están yendo las horas así. Una de la mañana. Si he sido demasiado política o poco política, no vamos a saberlo nunca. El tiempo se comprime y se está expandiendo el mar. Dos de la mañana. Hace dos noches, un grupo de mujeres danzaron a la luna en una ceremonia. Hay antepasados que velan la noche de las lobas. Tres de la mañana. Hace una semana, Molotov antitransgénica y un texto incendiario en una sábana. Hace una semana, se suicidó un hombre contra el país. Hace dos noches, casi pierdo todo jugando a la locura. Hace pocas horas, llegó para quedarse un animal. Hace tres meses, cinco de la mañana. Hace tres meses, más o menos, vivo con un desconocido. Reconsidero cosas que ya no me parecen tan terribles. Poco a poco nos vamos conociendo. Seis de la mañana. La poesía está callada últimamente. Siete de la mañana. Observo el silencio y trabajo con las manos. El tiempo está pasando. Que no nos quepa duda. Guayaba y pomas rosa para el desconsuelo. Ocho de la mañana. Ya casi no extraño a los amores viejos. Los edificios también desaparecen. Nueve de la mañana. Puse velas en un altar con piedras encontradas, sin ningún poder sobrenatural, y me he sentido protegida. Protegerse es prioridad cuando se hunde una isla. 10 de la mañana. Las amigas se van a Estados Unidos, pero anidan las tortugas. 11 de la mañana. Cierran escuelas, pero anidan las tortugas. 12 del mediodía. Hay una colonia de coral abanico creciendo saludable en el escambrón. El bosque secundario nos ayuda a enajenarnos. Una de la tarde. Imposible imaginarnos sin el monte que todo se lo traga cuando nadie está mirando. Bosque secundario, amo de la restauración ecológica. Dos de la tarde. Hace una semana el odio de Dios acaparó los medios. Hubo conciertos y hubo funerales. Personas vestidas de ángeles hicieron un cerco para proteger a los muertos del odio de Dios. Tres de la tarde. Trabajar sin paga, trabajar sin paga, trabajar sin paga. Cuatro de la tarde. ¿Cuándo vamos por fin a legalizar la marihuana? Cinco de la tarde. En mi ciudad, el sol cae todos los días detrás de buques de carga llenos de mercancía china. Es un espectáculo hermoso que nadie debería perderse. Seis de la tarde. ¿Cuántos amigos se fueron hoy del país? Pregunto. Y miro atardecer bruma insecticida sobre ciudad con playa. Siete de la noche. Si se acaba la cebolla, aquí no cocina nadie. La poesía llora con tanta realidad. Ocho de la noche. Haz el arroz que yo lavo los trastes. El género es un orden impuesto y nosotros no seguimos órdenes. Nueve de la noche. Escucha, las ametralladoras cantan cerca. Diez de la noche. Dame un beso. Once de la noche. La poesía ha muerto, pero estamos vivas. Doce de la medianoche. Puerto Rico ha muerto. Emborráchame. Antisocial, democra demo antisocial democra democracia, no, yo lo puedo decir. <ríe> antisocial democracia. 
Necesitamos saber vivir un jueves cualquiera a la sombra de un almendro, leer libros y escribir poemas, o empezar a pensar más coherentemente en cómo puede o cómo debe gobernarse un país ahora que el Estado no se hace responsable de nada. And then, ah, este era el otro file. Ayúdame, por favor. Yeah. And, sí, I want, this is the last poem I'm going to read from this book. And I want to, it, something happened a couple of months ago, which I thought was really interesting, and I still, I'm still processing it, but two different colleagues made translations of the same poems. And it's, it brings a lot of questions because the three versions are different poems. And then when you see one translation and then another, it makes you question your own words. <laughs> and I want, uh, I'm gonna read the poem in Spanish and then maybe Any of you can come and read the other two <laughs> translations. Conversación con Noricel Mazanet. This is a poem about friendship. And Noricel Mazanet is one of the most amazing people I've ever met. She's a, a true warrior. She raises goats and she grows her own food and she built her own house by herself. And she's trying to, make, to be free in a colony by doing these things. And, And she's one of my inspirations. Detrás de la ciudad, entre otras cosas, siembra hojas de varios tipos de orégano, hace pan a la leña, enrolla cigarrillos, hierve cuatro huevos y cuela dos tazas de café. La tala está crecida. La perra chiquita tuvo un accidente, pero se está curando. Teófilo me devolvió a Fidelia. Dice, no sé cómo voy a mudar las cabras. Cabo Rojo le palpita en la mirada. Se ve cruzando la isla a pie con su rebaño. ¿Y a ti cómo te trata el país? Me mira y me pregunta. Hace meses que no nos vemos. Hay inteligencia en las renuncias voluntarias. Buscando simplicidad se nos complica la vida. Con el tiempo, el tiempo no se siente igual. Sentadas en el piso de la terraza, tanta cosa importante por hablar entre nosotras. Jueves por la tarde nublada de verano, no hay más resistencia ni más lucha posible. Sentadas en el piso de la terraza vemos crecer el bambú. Procedo a contarle cosas de mis pobres matas. Ella piensa en el futuro todavía. Más allá del gobierno y más acá de teorías conspiracionistas. Su forma de hacer revolución es contundente. Pesticida y colmena no son metáfora en esta casa. Confieso llorar de rabia en la oficina de patentes municipales. Por más en contra que estoy de la Junta de Control Fiscal, yo tampoco encuentro mi sitio en el performance de lo político. Sin tiempo para preámbulos cordiales ni manifestaciones pacíficas, nos ocupa el trabajo y nos habita la espesura. En las manos reverbera el pulso. No es el país, es la tierra. No es el país, es la tierra. No es el país, es la tierra. No es el país, es la amistad. Sí, ¿qué hace? Leemos la de Emilia. 
Dale, sí. Dale, tú. Ok, yo la leo. <laughs> Conversation with Norisel Massanet, translation by Emilix Beatriz. Among other things, behind the city, she sews various oregano leaves, makes bread on the firewood, rolls cigarettes, boils four eggs, and brews two cups of coffee. The plot is overgrown. The small dog had an accident, but she's healing. Teofilo brought Fidelia back, she says. I do not know how I'm going to move the goats. Cabo Rojo pulsates in her gaze. She envisions herself crossing the island on foot with her flock. And how is the country treating you? She looks at me and asks. We haven't seen each other for months. There is logic in voluntary self-denials. Looking for simplicity, our life gets complicated. Over time, time does not feel the same. Sitting on the terrace floor, so much vital stuff to talk about between us. Thursday afternoon clouded by summer, no more resistance or struggle is possible. Sitting on the terrace floor, we see the bamboo grow. I go on to tell her about my poor plans. She still thinks about the future beyond the government, but this side of conspiracy theories, her way making of revolution is blunt. Pesticide and hive are not meta a metaphor in this house. I confess to crying with rage in the Office of Municipal Patents. For the more I am against the, the, fis the Colonial Fiscal Control Board, the more I cannot find my place either in the performance of the political. Out of time for cordial preambles and peaceful demonstrations, we are occupied with work and we are inhabited by the thicket, in our hands the throbbing pulse. It is not the country, it's the land. It is not the nation, it is the land. It is not the nation, it is the land. It is not the country, it is friendship. And then as a transition to invite Karina over, um, I think that Karina is one of those people that, with whom translation is a, a core part of our relationship. And we have translated each other and we will keep doing it. And I think that the bond gets deeper in, especially because it is about understanding each other. And I think that translation is a way in which that happens and, and in a successful way. And quiere venir? I feel I've been here a long time, so. I'm just going to do one. This is from a book called Dias Naturales, which was written in, during a work brigade after Hurricane Maria at Norisel Massanet's farm. So everything connects. <laughs> sí. Eh, voy a leer el segundo. Ese, sí. Okay. Solo la ciudad genera caos. El campo reverdece pronto después del huracán. Bolsillos sin gobierno donde los animales cantan y la lluvia no nos inunda la conciencia. Empezaron a volver las flores y los pájaros. Se vuelve a construir con madera caída la silla y la mesa y la casa. In my translation, only the city generates chaos. The country grows green again. Soon after the hurricane, ungoverned pockets where animals sing and the rain does not flood our consciousness. Flowers and birds are coming back. We build again from broken trees, the chair and the table and the house.
Mis amigas me inspiraron a leo, leer otras cosas. Um, my friends are inspiring me to read other things, but um, I'm going to start uh, like Raquel started by reading a little um, manifesto of sorts <laughs> about translation, que tiene que ver también con amistad. I didn't grow up speaking much Spanish. My father doesn't speak it, and in California, my mother was thousands of miles away from her Puerto Rican family. I knew nursery rhymes and the sound of my grandmother on the telephone. ¿Cómo estás? ¿Bien y tú? But my first word they say was in Spanish, más, meaning more, which I guess is what I've always wanted. I remain childlike and hungry for a world I don't know how to name. I used to be ashamed of my hand-me-down stitched together Spanish, but I'm learning, as Freud advises, to embrace my symptom. As a poet, that's a joke, that's a joke. <laughs> Isn't this a comparative literature department? <laughs> as a poet, I know that words, words always have the potential to exceed what we intend for them, even when we're all speaking the same language. It's impossible to account for every possible meaning in a poem, so the labor it takes to translate one does not come as a surprise. Translation makes my struggle with Spanish seem natural, even tender. Even if your relationship with another language is strained, translation can transform your anxieties, doubt, dependence, hypervigilance, into the virtues of an artist. And the person whose words you're translating will keep you company through it all. It's telling that the Puerto Rican poet I'm drawn to most, Mari Gloria Palma, is known for her mystery. Here is my translation of Norma Valle Ferrer's account of seeing her on the streets of San Juan. We were nearly neighbors, and I used to see her walking the old city tall, slim, almost always dressed in a black pencil skirt and shoes with very low heels, a bright patterned blouse. It pains me that I never approached her, but she always seemed so ensimismada. In every process of translation, there's always a word or 10 I don't really want to translate. Sometimes English swallows these words whole, no italics necessary deja vu, karaoke, schadenfreude. I nominate Ensimismada as an addition. It's rumor of M's and S's, the way it snakes around itself and then locks, da, like a necklace. If I translate it as self-involved, we lose this music and come face to face with all the negative judgments the music keeps at bay, too close for my comfort to selfish or stuck up. Ensimismala is really just the feminine adjectival form of ensimismo, meaning in itself. Walter Benjamin once wrote that content and language form a certain unity in the original, like a fruit in its skin. And shouldn't we all feel a certain unity at home in our own skin? For some, this feeling comes easily. If you and the world agree about who you are, if your social context has been designed to support your sense of individual coherence, if English is your first language and the language of the state, then you might not worry much about how you would be read in a foreign context. You might not worry about how you would translate. But who can afford to remain untranslated? And Simismada is the way someone else sees you. You've been caught in a reverie, and now your very relationship with yourself becomes the object of someone else's interpretation. Is she tired? Why doesn't she smile? Who is she? Where is she going? Why is she here? Maybe you're the sort of person, a female person, a migrant person, a brown person, who is not encouraged to have a relationship with yourself. The look on your face translates as unacceptably distant, as almost foreign. 
If translation describes how something is understood in a context that marks it as foreign, then translation happens whether or not we intend to perform it. But when I translate literature carefully, deliberately, I try to interrupt these ad hoc translations based on xenophobic logics, passing fancies, and lazy incuriosities. And when I'm reading translated literature, Thomas Tranströmer, Marie Indaye, Bay Dao, Elena Ferrante, I'm trying to listen for the ways my own patterns of thought are interrupted. Certain words stay stubborn on both sides of a border and don't seem to want to disclose themselves. I take that as a reminder that getting to know someone and getting to know myself is always an unfinished business. In the wake of Hurricane Maria, a mortal silence descended on my family's island, the silence just as political as material. Between frantic messages and fundraisers, I've tried to soothe myself by communing with the dead I've been translating a poem by Mariloria Palma called Twilight. The title is in English in the original, too. Palma must have been enamored of the way this English word envisions evening as the time of two lights, the moon and sun, maybe, or the self and other. I'm translating now. I make this light because I love it. It's mine because we are eye to eye mute correspondence. Her final line doesn't let me escape one language for another as I sometimes wish to. The original brings in a bit of English, so I preserve that by leaving in a bit of Spanish, or twilight, luz mia, twilight. Sometimes well-meaning people will say, I love the translations, but what about your own work? I don't really know what to say to that because the work feels like mine. You have to get inside the poem in order to articulate it, but the poem you get inside is someone else's. How else is anything born but through a foreign body? Just before I turned 30, I marked myself with a reminder and see me smada tattooed on my rib cage where my breath ripples the script so it looks like a ghost is writing. Even on our own, we're always in translation. Let's not pretend it isn't so. Bueno. Um, I am going to read a few translations of that poet um, from the essay, Mari Gloria Palma. Um, but partly the reason why I want to do that, besides she's amazing and you should learn about her work, is because she links um, Raquel and Nicole and I also. Um, I actually, I kind of met both of them through translation, more Raquel, because I was working on translating Palma. And in the US and even in Puerto Rico, there's not that many people working on um, her work. And so I literally like Googled. I was like, Mari Gloria Palma. I found <laughs> Raquel reading her poems on YouTube, like these bootleg recordings of uh, Raquel just at home, reciting poems Palma had written about New York. So there was also kind of a, a diasporic circuit moving there. And Raquel had also written an amazing essay about Palma and de Burgos, Julia de Burgos. Um, that cited a little, a little passage of Palmas that I was also translating. And so I literally, I DM'd Raquel, I was like, so, <laughs> we're friends now? <laughs> yeah, si, uh, uh, paso. Anyway, um, and with Nicole, we met also through poets, through Orayoan, the, the uh, poet who translated some of Nicole's work that we just saw. Um, and we've been translating each other back and forth for the, I guess, now four years um, that we've known each other. Um, I'm about to translate an essay that Nicole is writing for a pamphlet series for Ugly Duckling. Um, so it's been a beautiful, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but I just did. <laughs> bueno, um, I'm really, uh, that, I don't know. Okay, I'll say some things about this poem after I read it. Um, read its English version. Um, in English, I've called it Composition of a Tear, Composición de una Lágrima. Uh, from Palma. 
With a pair of scissors, I cut the fluent clarity of your tear. Miniature ocean of bitter tides, bubble of salt. I can see myself inside it. Its photographic lens strips me bare. It drops away from you and rolls on waves of air. I see my finest strand of hair dive down to you like the swallows that change the darkness, that chain the darkness to your mouth of coupled fish. Contraction of light, light's mandate, deluge. Your tear is my mirror. I look at the torn paper throat, the silent breasts like still bells. The nakedness of the body, disoriented vein that cannot mend its 20 crossings. I am and am not in the fogged glass of its circumference, peopled planet of your orbit, your purified tear. You cry, an alphabet in the sticky stratagems of sex. This tear of yours, this weeping wept dry, this human diamond, pure chemical formula that the wind must come to drink with its horn of pearl. I'm doubled between the fleeting reflections of your tears' two tracks, my cry burning with lemons, my endless yawn, and my umbrella. Oh, but that other one, that other one made with the groan of wild violets, that other one ignored. My protest, I curse your tear. I just, um, that shit is so contemporary to me. <laughs> um, there's, of course, everybody's always talking about what's lost in translation, but um, I just think that the, the homonym that exists in English between tear and tear in this poem is so, it's so amazing what the poem gains from that since it's about composition. There are metaphors of cutting of paper of writing throughout the poem. So I think sometimes we lose sight of those moments where a translation, a translation can become really incandescent. And I don't know that she was, I don't really think she was thinking about that, but a lot of Puerto Rican poets do have a really sophisticated bilingual imagination with English, and sometimes you can hear the other language below the line, even when um, that's not necessarily the intention, but it, it often is. I wanted to read um, uh, one more Palma translation, partly uh, to continue complicating this circuit. Um, I'm going to read the original as well because Nicole uh, lo leyó. En la presentación de Raquel, um, when Raquel presented their most recent book in Puerto Rico, Nicole read a Palma poem um, that's also about uh, violence against women. Um, Nicole, ¿quieres leer el, el original? Y... Just so you get a nicer, a nicer Spanish. From a book called Verso de Cada Día, this is number 38. Esta mañana, una amiga que estimo vino a verme. Va a comprarse un revólver. Tiene miedo que por donde trepa una enredadera que adorna su ventana, suba un felón armado y en vez de bella flor, sea un asesino. Curiosa perspectiva del minuto. Antes, una joven mujer con bello rostro salía de su casa a comprarse un sombrero. Hoy, cada cual anda instalando rejas y mirando hacia atrás en las esquinas. El parque está desierto, sus hermosos caminos olvidados, los lotos perecieron, Los ciudadanos prestos se recogen. Solo las golondrinas y murciélagos hacen ronda nocturna. Pasa la vida cargada de horas fétidas, de crueles horas rojas, amarillas y verdes. Justo en ese momento la vida lleva el fardo repleto de inmundicia, de escoria universal. 
salir a recoger claras sonrisas es ya función remota de otro tiempo. Hoy se recogen balas. Esto dice mi amiga acariciando su colt de acero frío y hambre de víscera. Gracias. Um, I hadn't thought about in, in the, that last verse, it says, hoy se recojan balas, you know, today we collect bullets, and um, I hadn't thought about that literally until this summer, right after the protests. Raquel and I just did a talk up in the Bay, a reading up in the Bay, in which we showed a few images from the protests and videos, and one of the videos I have is coming up through the Parque de las Palomas by the old city, picking up the rubber bullets um, from the police from the night before, literally collecting bullets. Everyday poems, 38 daily verses, there are another, I'm still toying with options there. <laughs> This morning, a friend I treasure came to see me. She's going to buy herself a gun. She's afraid a felon will climb the vine adorning her window instead of a beautiful bloom, an assassin. Strange split-second perspective before a young, sweet-faced woman would leave her house to buy a hat. Now she goes installing bars on the windows and each corner is a double take. The park is deserted, the lovely footpaths forgotten, the lotus flowers dead. The citizens collect themselves quickly, just the sparrows and bats make nighttime rounds. Life passes by with its load of fetid hours, cruel, red, yellow, green. Look, just now, life comes dragging its cargo replete with filth, with universal excrement. To go gathering clear smiles is now the hazy practice of another time. Today we collect bullets. So says my friend, caressing her colt of cold steel and gut hunger. Bueno. I have other stuff to read, but I think um, we have just a perfect amount of time to have a little conversation, and I want to make sure we leave that open. So, bang. I think there's another mi microphone. What we do not have is another chair like that, but that is definitely all. So we bring this chair. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, really? Oh, my God, really? Am I going to have to do this thing? <laughs> or, okay, perfect. Yeah. Oh, but it's so, I feel like I'm on a TV set or something. So. Okay. So, <laughs> thank you for all being here. Thank you for, that was amazing. Uh, I actually haven't, I haven't really prepared, is that the microphone or? Oh, it's, okay, perfect. So I wanted to ask, uh, I mean, I have a couple of questions of ideas, but I was just wondering if maybe you want to talk about future plans, uh, work that's happening in progress, collaborations that are happening in progress, or also just give a chance of, for people to ask questions. I don't really want to moderate this in any kind of like, you know, like a TV show from Bravo or something. So, uh, although I guess Bravo no longer has those kind of programs, but. Uh, so any, uh, let me take questions, sorry. Any questions, people? I knew Erin was. Gracias, thank you so much to the three of you. It was really beautiful. Um, as you were each um, speaking, reciting your own work, work of others, 
I was very aware of your voices and aware of the affect and the tone and the way that you pronounce different words. And first with Raquel, I was very aware of, I mean, you had already said and affirmed that you were a self-translator. And I felt, um, as you read both in Spanish and English, that both of the texts felt so much your own, even as you were th thematizing poetically um, experiences of, of displacement and, and, and unhomeliness and being outside of oneself. It was so interesting to kind of hear um, something that didn't, didn't sound like that. In other words, that the, the voice did seem to um, bring, bring along or carry along its text, and that, and that struck me. Um, and then, Nicole, when you were reading, um, I was so taken by just the little kind of bursts of laughter that punctuated the verses and, and how it's something that we can't read on the page, right? Um, and, then, um, and then, Karina, um, when you were reading, I was struck by something that you had, you had said, which was that when you were reading your own translation of another, it, it sounded like you were reading your own poem. It sounded like you were reading a poem that you had written. So I wanted to think about how perhaps each of you think about reciting poetry as itself a kind of translation so that there's a new work or a new version of a work that might come about in the live, you know, punctuated by doors opening and closing and all sorts of other kinds of sounds as well, of course. Um, um, how that becomes a new work, maybe for for each of you. Um, well, I uh, I became very obsessed um, when I was young with performance and performance of poetry and style, and I think I, I came from a very strong slam background, which I feel like a lot of people don't know about me. Um, when I was a teenager, and then um, I got a scholarship to go to Naropa University, and I. Uh, I heard of very different styles, you know, like I heard of Miri Baraka, and I got to like hear in person these poets that were doing a different kind of work. Um, and so I became obsessed with figuring out um, how I wanted my poems to sound in Spanish, um, and how that related to specific like styles, right? Like. Um, Inst that already exist in Spanish. Uh, for example, like La Masión en Puerto Rico, which is very like bombastic, sort of like, no sé si puedo declamar como. I'm not gonna do it. Tú puedes decir como que. El río arrastra ahora, el río tanto. I don't know. Um, muy, muy como, sí. A little bit like Dylan Thomas, but in Spanish, yeah. Um, sí, como muy rimbombante, muy como. And then like, it, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, and it'll happen like an older generation will like do that and they'll like perform it in this very like, I am the voice of the poet way, right? Um, and then I feel like there was a generation who was very influenced by Jose Raul Gallego Gonzalez and his style. It's a very specific like slam style um, in, in PR. We're, just, we're definitely that generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And hay como un cantadito. Como encantadito de nuestra generación, ¿no? Como there's like a little, a little, I guess like a poet voice, but like, yeah, like a specific poet voice to Puerto Rico and of a generation. Um, so uh, I spent a long time kind of trying to figure out what that voice is in my work. Um, and it's always open to like revision and coming back to it. I guess in that sense, it's not like, um, it's not like a translation in that, you know, I, the beauty of it is it's perennially open-ended, right? Um, yeah. I just want to add a little something. Um, I'm still, I guess, reflecting also on the event we did in the Bay Area. Um, Raquel and I had it written each other and exchanged some letters that were always intended to be public, um, but we'd never read them out loud. Um, and I guess I'm thinking about how like writing versus speaking um, manage intimacy differently. Um, and even though these like documents, like they began privately with the idea that they would be public, 
um, and they were written, not spoken. And in, because they were written, in some ways, I think it enabled Raquel and I to communicate intimately about things that we wouldn't necessarily talk about in with that level of detail face to face. And some of the things were vulnerable, and some of the things were very political. Um, and reading the letters out loud ended up feeling like more intimate than I had anticipated. Um, but at the same time, like I think there's this like cliche, or maybe I like I said that like I wouldn't say Derrida or whatever, but I did read that one thing, you know, about the writing speaking thing. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but that uh, like th there is kind of a cliche that um, speaking is more intimate than writing, but sometimes writing enables um, forms of intimacy that don't exist um, face to face. So I was thinking about that and also like how special it felt to even just briefly read a little fragment of a translation that I'd made of Nicole's poems while standing next, next to Nicole. Because translation for us often happens across like large geographic distances. Um, and seeing the way that translation has also so enabled us to close the geographic distance was like poignant. It's like because we b work on translation that we're here next to one another now, even though the translation I made of her poem occurred across a great distance. I think the translation is a relationship but, uh, but, uh, in itself. Say. Come on. Um, that I, I, I said that, <laughs> that I think that translation is a relationship in itself. Come on. It, at the core of translation, there's two people trying to communicate effectively. And going back to your question, for me, there's like a breach between the written versions of my poems and what happens when I'm reading them out loud. I'm a book artist, and I have a big fetish for the material of, of the book. And I design them, I print them, I make them with my hands, I make books for other people. And that's what I do most uh, right now. I have a, a print shop. And, and for me, the real relationship happens between the reader and the book. And it can have many sounds. And that part, I don't control. Come on, I control the silent part of poetry when I'm writing and when I'm making a book and when I'm sharing a book with other person. And, but then also at some time of my life when I was living in Mexico City, I worked with a group of women in a collective and we used to hold a weekly reading with a megaphone. And at that time of life, the oral, um, version or existence of the poems was the core of it because we were writing poetry to be performed. And I think that, that it changes a little bit how I write, like what's the main objective of it, but I feel more connected with the, with the book. So, and then, but when I'm reading, um, there's a lot of room for improvisation. And actually, that I think that that's something that was on my mind also when I was working on that project about Allen Ginsberg. Because if, if you look that poem uh, on YouTube, when you see Ginsberg performing the poem, he changes the verses all the time. Come on, he improvises. Every time he reads the poem in a different setting, it's a different poem. So that also allowed the possibility for thinking about the rewriting of that poem as many times as possible. Other questions? A question? Okay, um, so I'm really cold. <laughs> so I'm gonna um, try to be coherent, but I may meander a little bit more than usual. Um, <clears throat> so my question, I wanted to ask about, um, like if you have any thoughts 
on the relationship between translation and gesture. And so I'm thinking a lot about gesture. I don't know if I'm getting very far, but I am thinking a lot about gesture. And um, so I um, recently went through copy edits of my book. And um, one of the things that came up um, was I quoted a friend of mine who um, is a theorist of trans studies. And um, one of the things that she does in, she wrote a piece about trans femininity. It was like a phenomenological piece and she uses the term M to F and, and M to F was in the quote and <clears throat> the copy editor asked me to translate it. And I, you know, it was a little bit tough for me to reject the authority of the copy editor and say that I'm not gonna translate M to F. And part of the reason why I decided not to translate it because I was thinking about it in terms of the tone of the piece is for people who know what that means um, and don't need that translation. Um, and also I was thinking about Ansel Dua and refusals to translate there and also thinking about, um, I write on a Caribbean Canadian writer, Nalo Hopkinson, and almost all of the scholarship about um, the novel I write about, it's a novel called Brown Girl in the Ring, is precisely consumed with translating the references to Santeria, Conomble, Yoruba, to Western secular reason. Like literally that's what all the scholarship is consumed with. And, and so these are like two things that were in the back of my head. And, but part of it also was, I, you know, this is partially because it's someone I know really well, but also I think there's something about M to F that is more of a gesture and less definitive than male to female. And that seemed more along the spirit of like her politics. Um, and it's partially was um, like writing about herself. Um, and the piece was about the moreness of the transsexual body. So there, so I'm thinking about gesture in relationship to what exceeds the utterance, both in terms of what we cannot presently say and what we might never be able to say. And so I'm wondering about what this relationship is between gesture and translation, if you just have any thoughts on that. I have so many thoughts on that. <laughs> and thank you so much for that question. Um, um, first, I think that, you know, one of the kind of like um, original sins of colonialism is often talked about as erasure, right? But it's also translation. Um, and I think about this when I think of um, Fray Ramon Paneno and how, how a lot of the access that we have to like any written form of Taino like myth mythology is this this Spanish priest that was a colonizer, right? Um, which is so common. And I think that Part of the difficulty for me uh, with my relationship to translation is that I can't un I can't really unsee that violence as a constitutive of translation, but at the same time, um, like I you could say that about so much about being like in Puerto Rico, right? Like <laughs> so much of what we are is constituted by violence, and we also like disidentify with it, right? Like to borrow Munoz's term, or like engage with it in a different way. So that's not it. I like I feel like that's a that's an important point I try to make always, but it's not. It shouldn't be the end of a conversation, or at least in um, the end of, you know, like that's not enough. Um, <sighs> Uh, a lot of the work I do with self-translation is precisely not self-translating, right? And and thinking a lot about what I'm not going to translate and what I'm choosing not to translate. And so it's interesting because in some of the translations of, I think it was in some of Nicole's poems, like um, Guayaba gets translated as Guava. And for me, that's like, I can't do that. 
because guava is such an ugly word to me. And yet, like, I know there are different places in the Caribbean that have a very different relationship to that word. But for me, it's like, no, una guayaba no una guava. Like, and I don't know what it is about that, like, extra syllable or, like, something is happening there. But uh, affectively, I can't say guava. Like, I can't deal with it. Maybe it's that, like, I associate it with, like, like people who come from the US and are tourists and are like, I would love some guava juice or whatever, right? Like, um, and I'm sure different people associate it with different things, but I feel similarly about adoquines in the tertiary. Like I don't, I don't translate adoquines as cobblestones because I just have never associated the word cobblestones with like old San Juan and the architecture of old San Juan and the old colonial architecture. I associate it with like, I don't know, Charles Dickens or something, right? So um, I try to have as much of an affective relationship to my translation as I do to my poetry, um, and I try to really respect my intuition around that. And part of it is that I feel that like the violence of translation has an um, arbitrarity that um, justifies itself as an intrinsic logic. Um, and an example of that is Karina and I originally were going to publish the conversations with another journal. Um, and the copy editor went through and decided to put all of the words that they, they felt were um, in Spanish, in italics, which is really funny because at some point I sign, well, I sign these letters with my name, um, and Karina at some point refers to me as Raquelet, you know, with like E T T E at the end. And the copy editor put my name Raquel in italics and left et in like non italics. And I was just like, this is the arbitrarity of the system. Like, this right here is like, how totally random is that? Like, you know, and yet, when does when does a word become part of English, right, is the question, right? Like, all of these words that originate from, from French, right, when do they become part of the English language? And that becomes about nation, right? That becomes about the border. That becomes about, like, national politics. That, that becomes a larger, always doesn't become, it always was a larger conversation. So um, I really appreciate what you say about gesture because I do think that, like, um, you know, when I read my work in both languages, always there's a gesture there, right? And it's always very political, and it's always, I've, I've taken my work out of journals or I've withdrawn my work just on the basis of an editor saying that they're only gonna publish the English, right? Um, because for me, it's not a matter of how many words are on the page, it's a matter of like, the colonial history between Puerto Rico and the US. And of course, like in another context, you know, like, Spanish is the colonizing language, and this was a conversation I had um, with a very important um, Jasnaya, like a very important indigenous um, scholar. It was just like, yeah, well, you know, I I really understand how in Puerto Rico this is the positionality is is a colonial one in a way that's similar to the way like, you know, um, indigenous languages are in Mexico, you know, in relation to Spanish. So I think it's like I don't think of it as some intrinsic like value in a language, because I don't believe in a universal, <laughs> right? Uh, but I do think, um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there, yeah. Uh, I don't really, <laughs> I mean, I've thought a lot about that too, but I, I think we can leave it there. I mean, the, the only thing I'll say is that in that same um, copy editing experience, um, other things were also italicized, like um, moments of slang, um, moments of ways we were addressing each other that weren't legible to the copy editor um, that didn't necessarily have to do with um, a shared Spanish language, but a shared language of friendship and pop culture and all kinds of other like kind of subcultures that we share and create between us. Um, and I'm really interested, and in, it's interesting like that you're specifically talking about like the Yoruba traditions and the Yoruba language. I feel like those words often show up in Spanish too as gestural. Um, and in a recent round of letters that aren't out yet, like I was, I was trying to think about were kind of moments in pop music like "Mama say, Mama sa, Mama kusa," or like "Kimara, Kimara, Kima, Kimamba," um, that are not uh, real African words. <laughs> 
um, but that are invocation, Yoruba invocations, really, <laughs> you know, um, and ways that languages might find their way to us as gestures, even when they're not able to find their way to us as intact languages. And I think, of course, there's a lot of mourning to be done over not having access to the Arawak-derived languages of Taino people or the mix of African languages that were kind of spread throughout the Caribbean. Um, and of course, there's mourning to be done, but I also think gesture is often a way those languages stay with us, um, including in words that might be nonsense or be described as nonsense by people who don't know how to dance to them. Why not? <laughs> Your question makes me think also about the power of the decision and direction in which translation happens. And I think that Raquel's work is like a master in terms of that. And for me, living in Latin America, I've always, I, I made the decision that I wanted to translate um, Latin American poets into English, even though as being like uh, Spanish being my mother tongue, I'm, I'm not allowed to translate into English. But then there's, there's an important gesture in that direction that becomes political because, come on, it's an impersonation, but then, also, there's a, a problem there about understanding. Como, um, I don't think that native speakers of English are as capable of translating other language. Well, it happens in any language. But then como, there, there's a, a contradiction if, in to what extent you understand the language in, when you read it and when you deliver it. So. Come on, I don't have a, an answer for that, but, but I think about it often. Um, oh. <laughs> Hello, okay. Uh, I really liked the translation, the one you referred to as a loose translation. And um, I think one of you guys also s talked about uh, two, like a poem being translated twice and mm -hmm. it seeming like two different poems. Um, so I, I've also like, just practice language, I'll translate poems, and sometimes I see the difference between like directly translating it and then trying to keep some of the poetic language and maybe being less authentic word for word. So I'm curious as like translators, um, how much, like if, if there's like a threshold where it feels like you're directly translating a poem and then where it feels like you're kind of contributing to the poem in a way. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, there's one more thing I want to say about gesture after this. <laughs> but um, in answer to that, um, I often think that there's actually not a clear choice between those two options that were often given in kind of translation 101, like a quote direct translation and like a poetical translation. like. So often, I don't know what that line of poetry is even saying. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there are multiple options, even if I were to render it quote word for word. Um, that's one of the things that's so exciting about translating poetry is that poetry is usually um, has a different relationship to syntax, grammar, sound than quote prose language, um, so that. It's, um, it requires you to depart from a literal relationship to language from the jump. Um, and so I usually am not in my mind kind of shuttling along a like accurate versus poetical type of thing. Um, but there are many choices like in each line. Um, I don't know, I, I, I'll try to think if I have anything kind of more to, more to say about it. I think, I do sometimes, you asked like what, how, like how do we decide like when to like put ourselves in it, right? Sometimes I do have the impulse that's like, if this poem were mine, I wouldn't write the next line. You know, <laughs> like, it's like, it's like, and that to me is like a very instructive and real ethical moment 
in translation and it's one of the things that's exciting about it. Usually I, I translate some, I never translate something that I don't have love for, that I don't feel some kind of intimacy with and that I can't imagine myself saying. Um, but I also translate because I want to surprise myself and uh, exit myself and have a real encounter with somebody else <laughs> and some other way of being and speaking. Um, so I think that the way that I add myself in is often just in the choice of who I translate. It's asserting a relationship. It's asserting an intimacy um, without assuming it or entering without consent, as Raquel talks about, which is obviously incredibly complicated with the dead. Sometimes I think to myself, like, what would Marie Gloria like think of me? Like, would we vibe? You know, <laughs> and. Uh, so I think, yeah, the, the putting myself in is partly about who I put myself beside and who I kind of insist on being in relationship with. Um, and then um, with the gesture, I, ju I just want to go back to that for a second because I also think of translation as a, as a gesture of friendship, as we were talking about before. And in my experience with poets on the island, it's been a way to make myself useful um, when I often feel not useful. Um, and it's something that I can give and that can be exchanged that does not exist outside of the unequal circuits of capital between the island and diaspora, um, but does exist kind of like in excess of it. Um, and when people translate me or consent to be translated by me, there is a, it's a gesture of welcome, you know, um, that has been really important to, for me in forming community um, in Puerto Rico and, and beyond. I, I think what's interesting to me about translation and draw, drew me to translation, right, is uh, in trying to tease out like um, precisely like what what constitutes like differences in proximity between languages. Um, it does a work that's similar to poetry, or it goes to the core of like questions about language that poetry has been asking, or poets have been asking for a long time, right? Like. Um, you know, I think that poetry, uh, here I am trying to define poetry right now, uh, but there is a certain kind of attentiveness to language, right, um, that poetry does that that um, has an element that is fetishistic, which I'm into, um, which is the sense that like, it's not, there's not an, a meaning that's extraneous to like language, right? Or that like there's a real, there's something happening there that like isn't just sense making, right? There's something about language itself or a language itself. Um, and that, um, that, you know, like sound isn't just like, sound right um it's it's also like not so those things aren't like disconnected and there's not like a, necessarily a hierarchy i feel in poetry the way they might be maybe in i don't know i don't know i don't want to say something and then be like there's no poetry in there because there is yeah and then like you're quoting derrida right um <laughs> so i don't actually want to like prioritize that because i think it's already there in language i just think it's like poetry focuses on it in a specific way, which is interesting to me and always has been. Um, and I think translation um, kind of amplifies that in the best of moments and in other moments, it's just like useful, right? Um, but I would argue that even in the moments that it's useful, um, sometimes these questions that seem like aesthetic questions become primary to like why something doesn't translate, right? Or why something doesn't translate in a way that like, or why are the ways in which something becomes like a kind of like colonial text of violence, right? Like, um, I think of this moment in the Promesa law, right? Um, the law that establishes the fiscal oversight board in Puerto Rico that lowers the minimum wage for, to for everyone in 25 to 425 an hour that has led to the closure of over 400 schools. There's a moment in the law itself that attempts to define Puerto Rico. It's super interesting. Um, and it says something along the lines of wherever in this text it refers to Puerto Rico, it refer, it, we are referring to the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Like, 
And so it's a really interesting moment in which it's trying to define, but also translate what Puerto Rico is, which makes me think, like, what, what is the source text there? Like, what is the source definition of Puerto Rico, like, outside of this law? Like, this law is saying, OK, so in order to understand this text, we're going to translate that when we say Puerto Rico, we mean this thing. And I always was like, well, what? What, what do other people mean when they say what they're like, what's, what's happening before that, right? And I think that's a moment for me in which like this very legal, very like um, formal, like um, no nonsense sort of like attempt to translate actually becomes about um, something really deep, right? And something that like, I don't know. Yeah, I'm gonna leave it there. <laughs> and what I want, to add to your question is that the canon on, or, or tradition of translation tends to erase the translator as a writer. Como even it, it's recent that the name of the translator appears in a book. Como that wasn't the norm, I don't know, 20 years ago. And I think that's one of one of the reasons why I did that project about the loose translations because um, translating is writing, and I think that most of the best translations of poetry are performed by poets, and it's it's something that I like to keep in mind when. I work on translations or retranslations that there's someone there that's not the original writer who's also writing and who has a very intelligent mind and who's working with a text. Any more questions? Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you everybody.